So very grateful for this opportunity to come and minister to you wherever you are, whether it be nearby or far away. Now, all because you can only be with us virtually doesn't mean that you cannot actively participate with us. You can pray for the Lord to bless the services that are about ready to begin. Would you do that right now? There are people here on the grounds of gospel light and many watching abroad who need to hear the word of God. And some who have gathered need encouragement. Some counsel, others the gospel for salvation. But in truth, we all need the Lord, don't we? Well, the good news is he wants to speak to our hearts right now at this moment. So help us pray for that very thing to happen both here and there where you are. So once again, we want to welcome you to Gospel Light Baptist Church. Let's go into the sanctuary now together that we may worship the Lord. Service, Brother Matt. Got my days mixed up. Sunday morning service. Good to see each one of you here. Let's stand together, if you will. Turn to page 125. Page number 125. I'm glad it may not be long before Jesus will come back again. Marvelous message we bring, glorious carol we sing, wonderful word of the King, Jesus is coming again, coming again, coming again, maybe morning, maybe noon, maybe evening and maybe that song don't you the songwriter John Peterson had that right because he got that straight from the Word of God when he comes again he's coming to take us home with him are you ready for that you got to be born again or you're not gonna go with him if you're here without Jesus Christ we want you to know he could come this hour and I'm not being funny I'm not being cute he could come this very hour and if you don't know Christ as Savior, you need to get that settled. It's the most important thing in your life and your eternity. And you're welcome to do that even right now. Right now, these altars are open to receive a soul that's repentantly looking to Jesus Christ for salvation. Mind him today as he deals with your heart. Let's pray. Our Father, we bow our hearts before you, God, so thankful for the blood that you shed for our sin that gives us complete forgiveness, gives us that standing of righteousness before God, 
and standing before him at last, crowns at his feet we will cast. That's our glorious hope, our future. Should there be one that's here that is not prepared, not ready to receive that glorious homecoming of Christ, may they, may they make the plans necessary today, whether it be here or in the outreach church and Spanish church or junior departments. God, please move amongst our people today. Save souls and encourage the Christians. We ask you to do it, Lord, beginning with this good choir. Use them to give glory to your name. We pray in the name of Jesus, our wonderful Savior. Amen. You can be seated and enjoy the good singing from our choir.
Even so, Lord Jesus, come. We're ready for him. Hope you are too. We want to welcome you to Gospel Light Baptist Church. Those of you that are attending here and those of you that's viewing online somewhere in part of this great earth and those that's tuning in by the way of radio, we want to say thank you and welcome to Gospel Light. We're so glad that you're tuning in with us. Now, if you're here visiting for the very first time, very first time visiting, we're especially glad that you're here with us today. We count it an honor and a privilege that you take time out of your day to be with us. You're always welcome here at Gospel Light. And we show our appreciation by just letting you know that we're glad you're here. An usher will come up, and they're going to give you here in a moment a slip of paper. If you'll fill out that bottom piece, separate it from the form. The top is yours. The bottom, would you drop it in the offering plate? I like to say this, visitors, you're not expected to give to the offering today. If the Lord moves on your heart to do so, we'll use it for the furtherance of the gospel. But you're not required. Our members are, amen. Our members are expected to give to the work of God that they've joined themselves to. Let's have everybody stand. If you're a, vis a visitor for the first time, you remain seated. And ushers come in now. And gospel lighters stand. Grab a hymnal in hand. And Brother Mark's going to come get us a song. Page number 319, page 319, we'll sing the first verse and shake hands. Set my soul afire, Lord, for thy hope. Visitors feel welcome this morning. Start verse number two while you're finishing shaking hands. Set my soul afire, Lord, for the lost in sin. Give to me a passion as I seek to win. Help me not to falter, never.
nothing else will matter but to live for thee i will be your witness as you live in me set my soul afire lord set my soul afire make my life a witness of thy saving power billions grope in darkness waiting for thy word set my soul afire lord set my soul afire you may be seated Amen. Wasn't that a good song? We have a couple cards this morning. Dear church family, once again, let me thank you for all the wonderful support you gave us through all of Virginia's issues, especially these last three years, all the prayers, cards, calls, visits, and so much more. What a privilege to be a part of such a loving and caring church, Brother Frank and family. So continue to keep Brother Frank and their family in prayers. During a time like this, we learn how much our friends and relatives really mean to us. Your expression of sympathy will always be treasured. Thank you for the beautiful flowers and loving memory of our mother, Joel Trent and Alan Stockard. So continue to keep them in your prayers as well. If you take a look at your bulletin, we have a few announcements for this week. And the flowers at the pulpit are in memory and honor of Walter and Jackie Brewer. On their 76th wedding anniversary, they were placed there by her loving family. Also, the last junior week of Gospel Light Christian Camp is July 10th through the 14th. Sign up as soon as possible if you have a child that wants to attend. This is for grades 4th through 7th. The teens will be having a trip to the Wilds Christian Camp this week, so continue to keep them in your prayers this week as they'll be away from us. The Comfort and Edify Ladies Fellowship meeting is June the 29th from 6 to 8 p.m. in the small fellowship hall. So if you regularly attend that or want to attend, please attend that evening. If you'll take a look at the prayer list, bereaved this week, Carol, Carol Clifford in the loss of her dad, Mr. Pierce Corbett, Vicki Fritz in the loss of, his, of her brother-in-law, Mr. Charles Wilder, Robert Stroop in the loss of his sister, Doris Brame, and Nathan and Katie Pegram in the loss of their son, Oliver Pegram. Let's continue to keep all these folks that have lost loved ones this week in our prayers. In the hospital this week, Grady Whitehart, Kimberly Bullard, Wanda Spainire, Jane Hester, and Bill Stegall. Bill Stegall is the son of Marianne Stegall, and he's very critical in the Moses Cone Hospital, so they've asked specific prayer for that this morning. So let's continue to keep him in our prayers. Home from the hospital, Miss Vonda Nelson and Mr. Jean Larimore. So let's continue to pray for them as they're recovering. Um, those recovering from surgery, Carolyn Bowman and David Rumberg. And then upcoming surgeries this week, Mary Schuler. Uh, Gus Ochterberg, Charles Williams, and Billy Branson in the upcoming weeks. Some surgeries there. Other call-in requests that we've had is Pastor Jack Hilliard was recently diagnosed with cancer. So let's continue to keep him in our prayers. Philip Dodson with pneumonia. Peggy Linderman was hospitalized with a kidney infection. Cynthia Carter is in a lot of pain still. Um, Ellie Evans, a three-month-old with a serious breathing condition. And just a, a few days ago, Brother David Snow broke his collarbone. So let's continue to keep all these folks in our prayers. Let's remember to pray for our missionaries around the world and those that we support and are praying for. We pray that the Lord will continue to use their works there. Pray for those battling cancer, Melanie Sisk, Richard Rising, Price Redman, Sarah Herbert, Buddy Bowman, Charles Richardson, Robert Brown, Steve Whitehart, Jimmy Rousey, Roger Mackey, Tom Bruner Sr., Clinton Wiles, Stephanie Marsh, Karen England, 
and Jeremiah Clark. So let's continue to pray for all those that are battling cancer in our church family, that the doctors would have wisdom as they undergo treatments, and let's continue to pray for them. If the ushers would make their way forward, we'll make ready to receive our Sunday morning offering. Let's be faithful to give to the Lord as he's given to us. In just a few moments, let's remember Brother Matt as he brings the message and as the ladies' group sings. So by an uplifted hand, who would say, I have a prayer request to the Lord, a special need? And let's take these to the Lord in a word of prayer. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day to be in your house. We pray for all these that are battling illnesses and that are unwell. We pray that the doctors would have the wisdom to help them and give them strength as they recover. We pray for the different ministries going on right now. We think of those that are going to camp this week. We think of the last week of the gospel like Christian camp. We pray that you'd continue to work in a great and mighty way there and see souls saved. We pray that you'd be with the services this morning. We pray for Brother Matt as he brings the message in just a few moments. And as this ladies group sings, we pray that you'd bless the offering now. And we'll thank you for what you're going to do in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you, ladies. It was wonderful. Amen. I hope that it's not just a song, it's a truth. Truth in your heart. There's nothing that is competing for the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. Grab your Bibles and turn with me to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1. Sure to appreciate everybody that had a hand, whether it be physically or spiritually, praying for VBS this week. Uh, Vacation Bible School was a hit, and we had good turnout. We had good workers a uh, good turnout of workers, bus some kids in, many of the community parents within our region here, 
uh, drove their kids in. Church kids were here. It was just a sweet spirit every night that I was able to be here. And, and if you read your bulletin, I mentioned that we had well over 20 that made the decision to trust Jesus Christ as the personal Savior. And I shared Wednesday night, the first night of VBS on Monday, uh, they gave the invitation and, and one of the, Dalton Doby, he, uh, he received Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. And he was excited about it, got a picture of it, and uh, he was telling folks about it. I talked to Miss Donna, his mama, and she said, well, he went home and told his younger brother about it, and he led him to the Lord Jesus Christ. And I said, I think that's pretty good evidence and fruit that he got it, a burden for others. And that's what we're talking about here today. BBS was really a church's manifestation for a burden for souls. When a church loses its purpose of reaching out with the gospel to lost souls, it, it ceases to be a, a local New Testament church. It just becomes a social hall. It becomes a club or an organization. And the dangerous thing about that is the world out there can give people that. They can give a sense of belonging. They can give a sense of togetherness in clubs and, and organizations. But only the church can give the gospel. And only the church can give that glorious hope that changes a life and brings them to the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what young Dalton did, even as young as he is. We're talking today about that burden for the lost and a message that's simply entitled, Fishing for Souls. We're fishing for souls. And I want you to look at Mark chapter 1, verse 14. The Bible says, now after that John was put in prison, that's John the Baptist, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Now as he walked by the sea of Galilee, he saw Simon. We refer to him as Peter most of the time, but his name before Jesus Christ was Simon. He seeth Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And Jesus said unto them, Come ye after me, and I will make you to become fishers of men. And straightway they forsook their nets, and they followed him. And when he had gone a little further, thence he saw James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, who were also in the ship mending their nets. Straightway he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the ship with the hired servants and went after him. We're talking today about these four men, Peter and Andrew in specific, that became fishers of men. And Jesus Christ has not changed. I'm looking at a whole host of fishermen and fisherwomen. And we're not after those scaly, slimy things. We're after souls that live forever. And that's the whole purpose of Gospel Light Baptist Church. Let's pray together. Father, we, we rejoice, we're humbled in how you allow the ministries here week after week to see souls be receptive to the gospel and trust Jesus Christ as their Savior. We're humbled. God, we do not take that for granted. We realize that you're a good hand of, upon us. And Lord, we plead that it remain good upon us. And Father, I pray that you would once again, as a message concerning the burden for souls is preached from this pulpit, one of hundreds, we pray that you would work again in our hearts, especially mine, Lord. Burden us with your burden, O oh Lord. And I'm asking if there be one here that's lost, may they receive you today as Savior of their life and of their eternity. We ask these things in your precious name, dear Lord Jesus. Amen. You know, I, I've just talked about VBS. I never talked about camp, the summer camp up in Hillsville, Virginia. I never talked about reaching the triad for Christ. I never talked about our Sunday school and youth programs. I never talked about our missionary endeavor and outreach. But all of these, our bus ministry included, all of these are geared for one purpose, to get the gospel out to whosoever will, that they might call on Jesus Christ and be saved. That is the only thing in life that matters. And I don't know of anything that's more thrilling than to know that God can use you and I in the salvation of a soul. It's an amazing thing to think about. There's nothing more fulfilling than to be part of somebody that is going to come by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, receive him as Savior. In verse 16 of our text, you see Simon and Andrew, they're living in the final moments of a Christless life. 
You know, we all have a B.C. in our life. You say, I didn't live in B.C. We live in Anno Domini, the year of our Lord. We live in 2023 A.D. Well, you have a B.C. in your life too. It's before Christ. And here we have Andrew and Simon, his brother. They're living the final minutes of their life before the most life-changing thing ever occurred. They met Jesus Christ. How many of you remember when you met Jesus Christ? He came by your way some way, changed your life and your eternal destiny forever. You know, we're talking about Simon and, and Andrew here and James and John. And they were fishers, the Bible says. In other words, they used nets to bring fish out of that salty uh, life of the Galilean Sea. And as they would pull the fish out of the Galilean Sea, they're pulling them out of an environment of life. The fish, when pulled out of that environment of life, die. It's the opposite when you fish for men. We pull them out of an environment of death. And God uses us to bring them into life. And not just a life that's more abundant, more fulfilling here, but we bring them into everlasting life. God does through us. I know you understand what I mean by that. But where our hands are used to bring people from death unto life. I want you to listen how Jesus said it in John 5, 24. It's one of the greatest verses that you can leave a soul after you've led them to the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said, Verily, verily, or truly, truly, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath, present tense, hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, and here it is, but is passed from death to life. The very moment that you trust Jesus Christ by faith as your Savior, you've passed from death unto life. And it's the very opposite of what the fishermen experience here. When fishing for souls, God uses us to bring souls from death unto life. Because of this, Jesus comes up to these four men and he says, Come after me and I will make you to become fishers of men. Something far more uh, important than just pulling fish out of the Galilean waters. I'm talking about leading men and women and young people to an eternity with me. That's what's being mentioned here. What an exciting opportunity. What a thrilling opportunity to be thinking about that God can use me and you to do that. Now, there's three thoughts I want to get into your mind and heart about fishing for souls today. Number one, notice in verse 16 and 17, the people of God. Who is it that God chose and used? The Bible says here, as Jesus Christ walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, fishers. Simon and Andrew, now I'm not berating that profession at all. As a matter of fact, that's a very grueling, very, very difficult occupation to have, especially in those days. But just who was it that Jesus Christ chose to use? I just want you to get this. He chose very common people, common men. He didn't go into the palaces of royalty. He didn't go into the places of high commerce and business. Jesus Christ just took a stroll on the beach of life. And he said, there's two men over there that I'm going to use in a, a magnificent way. Do you know, most of the time, God just takes ordinary people like me and you, and he does extraordinary things with them. Just ordinary people. I want you to listen to 1 Corinthians. You might want to pencil this in the margin right there be, beside verse 16 and 17 of Luke or Mark 1. But listen to 1 Corinthians 1, 26, what the Bible says. Paul is talking to the church of Corinth, and he says, For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But listen to the next verse. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised hath God chosen. Yea, and things which are not to bring to naught the things that are. Now, I want you to listen to what Paul's trying to get across to the church there. And he says, do you want to know the kind of people God's looking for? Do you want to know the kind of people that God is enlisting in his army? He said, I'm going to mention a few of them for you. And here they are. He said, the foolish. Now, in the Greek, that word is moron, from which we get the word, you're a moron. But it means simply this, non-intellectual. It's not people of high intellect necessarily that re respond to God's call. God can use the non-intellect. The word weak here that Paul uses means sickly, those without strength. 
People in wheelchairs, people that have ailments and infirmities that the world would say, well, you're automatically knocked out of any use for us. God can use them. As a matter of fact, God can use those people most of the time in a greater way than he can use a healthy person. The word base Paul used, what does that mean? It means low. Those without any kind of pedigree, any kind of great heritage. Hey, is there anybody here that's first generation Christian? You didn't have godly mom and dad? Listen, God's looking for you. He's looking for anybody that's willing to say yes. God can use you. The word despise, Paul used. The Lord calls the despise. What's that mean? It's the ignored people. So people in which the world looks down upon. They snarl their nose up, look away from, sneer at. God said, that's okay, I'll use them, send them on over to me. Now that's what Paul said. God uh, uses those kinds of people. Now of such people, God forms his mighty army to reach the world with his glorious gospel. Now, I don't know about you, it makes me feel good. Someone said, man, alive, that puts us in a pretty, pretty low crowd. Look, can, I, can I break some information to you? We were in a low crowd when Jesus found us. All of us were headed to a place that we didn't want to go to called hell. And Jesus Christ came and said, you can be somebody in me. I'll take nobodies and make them somebodies. All of us, friend, all of us came from that low, low place of life called sin. So Paul's just telling it like it is. Don't get mad at Paul. But why would God chose these kinds of people to be used in his great army to reach the world? Well, the Bible goes on in 1 Corinthians, verse 29. He said that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. That he that glorieth will glory in the Lord. Let him glory in the Lord. Why does God use those kinds of individuals? Why did he say, hey, Simon, hey, Andrew, come over here a minute. So that nobody in that pharisaical group or that group of the Sanhedrin or that religious time could say, well, well, you know, they are receiving people of accolade and they're receiving people by a number and they're receiving a great multitude because they're suave. They're the kind of people that are very charismatic and it just naturally draws people. No Matter of fact, when they appeared before the religious crowd, they called them unlearned men. But they took knowledge that they'd been with Jesus Christ. There was something supernatural about the natural. And God, when that happens, it's him that gets the glory. Not anybody else. Woe to the preacher, to the Christian, to the ministry, to the church that lifts themselves up. Look out, because God will bring them down. God will use that low person as God, as that person allows God to use them. I want to say this, God rarely calls the equipped. He does, but it's rare. God rarely calls the equipped, but he always equips the called. He always brings us from nothing up to something and does something wonderful with us. And God wants to use you this morning. I'm not just saying that like some motivational life coach. You can do it. God wants to use you. I'm saying it from the Bible's text. God wants to use you, sir. You, ma'am, a young person. He wants to use your life. And he can see it from this point forward, what it's going to be. All the great things that he has in store. God wants to use you. He didn't choose them for what they were, but he chose them for what he could make of them. He knew what they could be. And God is looking at anybody. God can use Very uncommon people. God can use the common. God can use the very uncommon people. God can use the billionaires of the earth. God can use the millionaires of the earth, and he surely does. Don't get it in your mind that the small and the little and the abased are the only ones that God uses. Not so. God will use anybody that's just open to his call upon their life. How greatly God can use a person with great talent and treasure. If they will only let him. Many of you have probably heard of the name of C.T. Studd. C.T. Studd was an Englishman of nobility. Comes from a wealthy family in England. He was sent to Cambridge University, England's greatest university. There he becomes the nation's top cricket player. He has a career ahead of him. He has nobility. He has all the money behind him. He has notoriety behind him. 
But then a man by the name of D.L. Moody came his way. And D.L. Moody and Iris Sankey hold an evangelistic meeting in England, of which one of the converts is C.T. Studd. And C.T. Studd gave his life to the Lord Jesus Christ, and he made this comment. He said, up until that point, the Bible was rather dry. He said, but then it became everything. And C.T. Studd, with everything that he had, became one of the Cambridge Seven. Do your study on that. I don't have time. But it was seven missionaries that impacted the world for Christ like few ever have. This was a man who came from everything and gave everything to the Lord Jesus. God can use those people of nobility. How many of you ever heard of a man by the name of R.G. Letourneau? R.G. Letourneau. Back in the past century, in the early, early time of that century... He was a sixth grade dropout. He goes on and he forums, at that time, the world's greatest earth moving equipment production. He has four different plant, or he has plants on four different continents. He has over 300 patents regarding heavy machinery that moves the earth. He becomes an instant billionaire, millionaire, whichever one that that was. But this man, also saw the need to reach the world with the gospel. He saw God as the one giving him all of the finances and funds that he had. And he says, it seems to me that God needs a businessman. R.G. Letourneau is the one that you hear about that said, I'm going to give God 90% and I'll live on the 10. And R.G. Letourneau was used mightily of God. This was a man that had great wealth and great resources and God used him greatly. Don't think that God cannot use people of position and stature. The problem is the world sees that and throws so many opportunities at them that they get distracted. But God will use anybody. Who's the people that God uses? Whoever says, here am I, send me. Don't matter who it is. The people that God uses. But would you notice the purposes of God the purposes of God. In Luke 19.10, there's a very well-known verse of Scripture that you know, and it's God's mission statement. It's the whole purpose of what happens. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was said, lost. The Son of Man, Jesus Christ, came down to this earth to save you and I. Now, what is God's purpose? Can I tell you that his heartbeat is one of a missionary's heart? His heartbeat is one of a soul winner's heart? His heartbeat is one of a gospel witness heart? That's the heart of God. And what did Jesus Christ say right here to these men? He said this, if you'll look at your Bible, follow me and I will make you to become fishers of men. If you're a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, follow me. You're going to have the burden that Jesus Christ had. You're going to have the same purpose and the intent that Jesus Christ had. What is that? Share the good gospel of the good news of Calvary and the empty tomb that whosoever will believe upon that may have eternal life. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Follow me and I will make you to become. In other words, if we're following Jesus Christ, is it not true and right thinking along this line of thought that we'll have the same heartbeat as Jesus Christ? Sure we will. We'll be concerned about lost people too. A man or a woman that says that they are a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ and not concerned about the souls around them or being a fisher of men, can I say it like this? They're confused. They're confused. Now, I'm going to be gentle here today. They're confused. They're either a hypocrite belonging to a ministry, an organization, or a church that teaches it, believes in it, and they just don't believe in it. Belong to an identity, but I don't believe in that. Maybe they're a hypocrite. Maybe you're just backslidden. Maybe you just lost the passion for the lost. Or maybe perhaps you're just unaware of God's purpose. Maybe you come out of a, a religious institution or a church that never even focused upon it. Maybe you're just ignorant of that fact. But if you're going to be a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, mark it down. You are going to have a burden for the lost. You're going to have a burden for them. John Wesley said this, you have only one business on earth that is to save souls. It is to lead people to the Lord Jesus Christ and a church that has God's purpose in its heart is reaching out to the lost world every method, every availability, every way we possibly can. We're doing it through the internet. We're doing it through the radio. We're doing it through the printed page. We're doing it through the, the preaching of the Bible. We're doing it one-on-one. -on -one. We're trying to reach our Jerusalem. We're trying to do everything we can to get the gospel out. That's the command of the church. 
and its members, its membership can participate in so many different ways in that purpose. You have different ways that every one of you are participating in this, but we're all enlisted. Every one of you are enlisted in God's army to take the gospel to the whole world, the whole gospel to the whole world. Every one of you should have part in that. When I was in the United States Marine Corps, we had a term for those that were not in the infantry. Now, for our Marines that are here, you understand that 03, that is the, the numerical value for an infantry person, 0311, basic rifleman, whatever it was, mortar man, machine gunner, whatever it was, if you were 03, you were considered to be <clears throat> the backbone of the United States Marine Corps. They kind of walked around their chest out with their head high and an attitude to go with it, to be honest with you. I was an 0311. I was a basic rifleman in the infantry. Now, we had a term that we would use for people that weren't 03 or in, in the infantry. We called them pogues. Pogues. It's nothing derogative. It's nothing bad. It stands for a position other than grunt. In the Marine Corps, a rifleman or an infantryman is called a grunt. And I'll tell you why they call them grunts. Because you do a lot of grunting. Carrying 60 and 80-pound packs. It's rough. It's hard. So we said, that, that's a pogue over there. That guy in supply, that guy in intel, that person over there in, in the motor pool, that person that's whatever it might be, they're a pogue. That means position other than grunt. But wait a minute. That's wrong. And I'll tell you why. Because every Marine that has walked across the graduation deck of Paris Island or MCRD San Diego, they're as much a Marine as anybody else. And I'm going to tell you something even more important. Hang on, because I'm getting to a point. The infantry would grind to a sudden halt if it wasn't for supply. If it wasn't for intel, S3 and S2. If it wasn't for people that made sure you got there on ship or by carrier or by whatever it was, an LAV, whatever it was. If it weren't for the people behind you, then the people doing the fighting would have nothing to fight with. Beans, bullets, and band-aids, stop. Now, compare that on the church setting. We put a lot of emphasis in the independent Baptist movement on soul winning, and rightly so. That's our history. That's our heritage. Baptists have always been people that believed in reaching the lost. Always have. We always will be. Now, that being said, we do put an emphasis on bus workers, door knockers, people that get out there and, and go face-to-face -face at it. But the people that are here giving in the tithe are just as important. The people that are here praying are just as important. The people that are here teaching the children once they come in are just as important. The people that are there in the trenches are just as important as the people that are making sure everything is ready for them to go to the trenches and everything is ready when they come out of the trenches. What I'm saying is you all are soul winners. You have a part in the ministry of gospel light that takes the gospel out. Every soul that Brother Frank stands and reads that has come to Christ, you have a part in it if you have, if you have participated as you should as a church member. I pray for them. I, I support through tithes and offerings a church that believes in reaching the gospel. You have part in it. Now, that doesn't mean that you should not have a burden to talk to that person beside you in the community when God says... Talk to that person. God opens that door up. Some kind of communication comes across and they talk about death. Or they talk about, well, I hope I get to heaven one day. Hello, there's a wide open door. The Spirit of God has just kicked in. Walk through it. Every one of us ought to be so conscious. Waiting for the opportunity to, to reach somebody with the gospel. But I don't want you to get the idea that only the soul winners that knock on the door and, and are reaching the triad team and our bus, I, I don't want you thinking that's the only way to soul win. You got me? You have part in it. And I'll, I'll back that up a little bit further as we go on here. What I'm saying is it takes all of us. God uses each of us in a very unique way for his purpose of the world getting the gospel. If you're born again and you are a member at Gospel Light that is a soul winning church, you are to function in the role and the position that God has given you the ability wherewithal to function. Function in that place. Brother Matt, I can't get out like I used to. I'm physically enabled. Pray for the conviction of the Holy Ghost to fall upon the people that hear the message. 
Pray for the soul winner. Pray for that individual worker. But you have a part in the ministry. The question is, are you following Jesus? And if so, if you're right close to his heels, following him, you'll pick up the same burden for souls and you will be a fisher of men. You will be. You'll have that heartbeat. And so there are people of God. He'll use anybody that's willing to let him use them. But also there's the purpose of God that they accomplish. I like the way Brother Frank said this a long time ago. It stuck with me good. God builds the church and he does it through his people. It's not the people building the church. Heavens know it's God through his people building the church. I want you to notice last of all, this is the biggest point, the promise of God. I want you to listen to the record. Flip over with me to Luke 5. We're going to be there the remainder of the time. Luke chapter 5. Listen to how Luke explains this same setting that Mark records in chapter 1. Luke 5. We're talking about the promise of God to the people of God who are doing the purpose of God. We're not going out alone in our own ability. We're going out in the power of God. Now, we see this here in Luke 5. Would you look at verse 4 once you get there to Luke 5? The Bible says, now when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, the same fellow back there in Mark 1, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draught. Same setting. Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word I will let down the net. And when he had done this, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes and their net brake. And they beckoned unto their partners, which were in another ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both the ships, so that they began to sink. And when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he was astonished. And all that were with him at the draught of the fishes which they had taken. Now we're looking here at the promise of God, the power of God that we have. Here's what I want you to get from this text. It encourages me so much. God's working on both ends of the fishing pole. He first works on that fella or that lady that's holding the end of the fishing rod that he's saying, just trust me and put it out. He gets you to the place and me to the place where we surrender, as Peter said, nevertheless. Now, what we don't know, he's been working out there too. He's working on the other end of the fishing line. Do you remember when Peter came in rushing into the room and he said, Lord, uh, uh, they came and asked if we pay taxes. And I said, yes, my master pays taxes. And Jesus said, go out, get a line, cast it into the water, and you're going to find a coin in the fish's mouth. Now, he was working on Peter's faith. Will you trust me? Will you believe that I'm going to provide for the taxes? Nevertheless, I put it out. And there was a God I don't know if he got that old sucker fish, whatever it was, to suck up a, a piece of money. And then he says, come over here, guides him, and he bites the hook. Peter reels him in. There it is. I'm telling you this. God works on both ends of the fishing pole. In our terminology, he deals with the church's heart to say, I'll trust you. But on the other end, what we don't know is he's convicting that individual of sin, and the providence of God crosses our paths. And There it is. And it's God that's doing all of that work there in verse 4 of our text here in Luke 5. Look again. Now, when he had left speaking, he said unto them, Just launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draught. We're just simply to trust God's promise. How? Launch out in the deep. Now, I'm going to tell you something, friend. That's a matter of faith. It's a matter of surrender. I've been at this thing all night. Get out into the deep water. Most Christians, and myself included, we're content playing in a kiddie pool. We like it because it doesn't require much effort. We get the fun of the water. Uh, It's nice and warm, and we like it there. What you don't know is there's a bunch of kid pee in the kiddie pool. Get out in the deep, and you won't find that. So the Lord says, no, get out of your comfort zone. Get out of your logic. Just trust me. Get out into the deep water. I'm going to tell you something. There's where it's getting hard increasingly hard and frustrating to do in this day and age. Churches are being threatened. Churches are being uh, silenced. They're trying to be restricted. And it just takes churches of dogmatic biblical faith that says we're going to go regardless. We're going out. 
We're going out into the deep, to the unknown. We're going out to that troubled water. Why? Because there's troubled souls out in that troubled water that needs the gospel. We need to be that lighthouse. Here's where most of us fail. We just never launch out because it's so easy to sit in a church like Gospel Light, take notes, and enjoy the fellowship. And, but if we can, we must determine to launch out. I said, if you can, determine to launch out. There's no fishes that are caught by accident. Once in a while, the Lord will let a fish drop in your lap. But most of the time, it takes us casting out the line and getting out there and fishing. I had a, a Bible uh, professor. He said, listen, fellas, you got to get out there and fish. He said, fish don't just jump in a five-gallon bucket. You've got to get out there after. I mean, unless it's one of these crazy, crazy Asian carp that you're seeing jump in the river into the boat. Some of you sportsmen know what I'm talking about. That's a crazy fish. But if you're going to catch a fish, you've got to get out and you've got to wet some lines. You've got to drown some worms and you've got to get out after them. Most of us, though, and I say this carefully because I'm guilty. Most of us would rather be keepers of the aquarium rather than fishers of men. You get a church this size, you get involved in a church this size, and we generally have good crowds, and it's easy to get comfortable, complacent. Numbers are up, giving is up, attendance is up, and we lose focus. You lose focus. We're keepers of the aquarium rather than going out and getting fish put in the aquarium. Now, thank God we've not fallen into that, but be careful. Every Christian ought to be a missionary at heart. If nothing else, to the supermarket, to the bank, whatever. I want you to see there. Look at verse 5, please. Simon answering said unto him, Master, we've toiled all the night, taken nothing nevertheless. At thy word I will let down the net. You're to trust God's promise, not only by launching out. As you launch out, you're depending on Jesus Christ, number two. You're, you're just depending on the Lord Jesus Christ. I think one of the greatest things I struggled with in personal soul winning and evangelism as a young preacher was I had it in my mind I had to have the approach, I had to have the, the wording right, I had to have everything just right, and it was all on me. So when I'd walk up to a house, I'm scared to death because I'm going to mess up. But as you go along this thing, you see, when God does allow you to lead someone to Christ, you see, man, and I blundered that up, that was a mess. I remember preaching messages as a young man about tithing and being harsh. People coming and getting saved. Didn't have a thing to do with that. What's going on? God's on both ends of the fishing pole. He's doing the work that you're completely oblivious of. You realize it's God that's doing that work. It's the Holy Spirit that's doing that work. And if he has one that is ready to save, he's going to cross paths. Don't worry about the wording. Just be sweet and give the gospel. And they'll respond to that. Peter said, at thy word. Lord, at thy word. Do you hear the helplessness that's in that of any self-effort? I've tried and I've failed. Lord, but at your word, I'll do it. Now, I want you to notice two words in verse 5. The one is the word we, and the second one is the word nothing. And when you understand those two words, look at everything that's between it. Anything that begins with we ends in nothing. I have not the power to convince somebody of being saved. As a matter of fact, Adrian Rogers used to say this, anything you can convince a man to believe, some other man can convince them not to believe. It's going to take the Holy Spirit of God that convicts that soul that Jesus Christ is the way. Now, I'm just the messenger. I'm just the mailman. That's all I am. It's all you are. And Jesus Christ does all of the work. Anything that begins with we alone ends in nothing. Peter said, we have toiled all the night and have taken nothing. Nothing. Now I'm talking about folks who have a desire to reach people for the Lord Jesus Christ and truly win souls, but they, they don't have any fruit. Sometimes that may happen because we are working in the energy of our flesh and abilities. I don't care how smooth you are, how suave you are, how charismatic you are. If the Holy Spirit of God is not there doing the convicting work, it's useless. By the way, if he's not there 
and you're pressuring somebody with salesman-like tactics, they're twice the child of hell they were before you met them. Because if they're truly not convicted by the Spirit of God and understand what it is they're being saved from, and they just say a prayer, now they have false assurance. Be careful. Be careful. God's got to be doing the work on both ends of the fishing pole. Got to rely on Jesus Christ to do something supernatural. What is that? Conviction and conversion is of him. We're just messengers. So Jesus said this, come after me. That's step one. And then I will make you become fishers of men. But you've got to come after me first. Learn of me. And I'll go with you where you go. Third point of all, trust God's promise by just letting down the net. He said, Simon, launch out in the deep, number one. Verse five, number two, depend on me. At thy word I will. And then just let down the net. Nevertheless, I will let down the net. Well, do you know what the net is here? Representation of the gospel. The glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. Christian, if you ever get tired of hearing the gospel, you need revival. If it ever gets old hat to you, you're in trouble. Because that's what saved you from hell. That's what can be spoken to another individual to spare them from a place called hell. Everything that we try to print, if we have the ability to do, we put the gospel out. We just recently had a a fit with a a drug company here in the area, and they kind of went left. We had a contract with them. We put the gospel on every prescription bag. Say, Brother Matt, why would you do that? Because there are people that are addicted to medication that need help. We have an RU ministry that can do that. It don't have come to gospel light and reformers unanimous. It has the gospel on it. That which can free an addict or, or, or anybody for that matter. Why do we put them everywhere we possibly can? Because it's the gospel that is the power of God unto salvation. It's so important. The gospel is what saves. Some folks have this idea. Well, I believe in lifestyle evangelism. And listen, there's a place for that. Uh, They're going to see my life, and my life is going to be so good that it's going to draw them to Jesus and they'll be saved. Well, listen to me. That's good. You need to have a good testimony to have a hearing with that person. But lost souls are not saved by your life. They are saved by his death. They've got to hear of the gospel. What is it? It's the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's not a man or a woman that's acting the part. That's certainly going to get their attention and will give them a desire to have what that person has. But friend, they need to be born again by the gospel. Suppose a fisherman returns from a fishing trip and somebody asks them, did you catch any fish? The fisherman looks back to them and replies, no, but I stood on the bank in the best fishing apparel I could possibly find. You look good. You look the part. You're doing everything you should. But you've got to get the line under the water to catch the fish. And what I'm saying is somebody can watch you and appreciate your separated position with Jesus Christ, but that's not what saves them. The red, royal, ruby blood of Jesus Christ and the gospel saves him. They need to be told. So there needs to be a confrontational point somewhere, either through a gospel tract, a message, a CD, something. They've got to hear the gospel. They've got to hear it. That lifestyle helps in that. Now listen. Think about anybody, just about anybody can take a tract and dangle it in front of a person. I'm a backward guy. You say, Brother Matt, you're back. I am backward. I'm the guy that in high school when someone would say, "Uh, Matt Morrison, here, here. Is he here? Here. You say, how in the world do you do what you do? Only by the power of God. I'm as backward as the day is long if you get to know me. But I can walk up to somebody and say, just want you to know gospel light loves you. Would you, would you take time to read this? Yeah, sure, I'll, I'll take that. Thank you. It, about anybody can dangle a track like you dangle a lure in front of a largemouth bass. What is it that hooks them? It's the gospel. What is it that gets them into the place of being with Jesus Christ? It's the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ that does that. Let down the net. What is the net? It's the gospel. Get it out. If you call Brother Frank on his cell phone and you don't get him, you're going to get a good presentation of the gospel. It's so long and so lengthy, the phone cuts him off. (laughs) 
And if you call me and you can't get through to me, I have something similar. It's amazing. People will call you up, don't get you, leave a voicemail. Brother Frank, I'm, I'm sure you understand what I'm about ready to say. Some of them are so troubled, their voice shakes because they were just confronted with the gospel. And they're troubled. I've had people leave messages that they, they had a hard time finding words until they got their mind right and then left a message. Others it made angry. One lady I was calling over at Duke University, she called back and she, she told me some things that I was asking her about. And she said, I told my secretary, she said, I'm so glad he has Jesus as his secretary, but I need to talk to Mr. Morrison. She started laughing and I started laughing. She said, I'm a believer too and I appreciate that message on your phone. Amen. What is it? It's the gospel. The Amen. gospel. We're trusted or we're trusting God rather also. Final point. Continuing on after we failed. This is, this is a good one. Say, brother man, I did dangle the gospel track. I did leave a message. I am talking, but I'm not getting anywhere. Simon was going to give up too. He said, Master, we've told all the night and we've taken nothing. I'm going to tell you something. I believe that God will bless your effort. I'm not seeing. Doesn't mean that God's not pleased. Doesn't mean that he's not blessing. I believe a church that has a burden that goes out, if they don't see the number that they would like, God's blessing them in other ways. He brings them in in the back doors. People that's been looking for a church, they show up. There they are. God puts... The numbers on the board, he puts the money in the coffers of a church that has his heartbeat. Simon said, I'm going to give up. But suddenly there were so many fish that the nets broke. And he said, guys, come over here. We need more boats to put in the fish. Just when he was about ready to give up, a supernatural thing happened. God showed up. You just keep sowing the seed and sowing the seed. And the master that gives harvest to that will let you see it. Someone may say, but that was Peter, the great preacher of Pentecost. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. There was another fella in the boat. Luke doesn't even mention who it was. Mark said his name was Andrew. Andrew, who was he? According to the Bible's record, Andrew was the kind of guy that was backward. He was quiet. He was reserved. He wasn't the boisterous Peter that stood and preached and 3,000 got reeled in that day. Andrew was a common fellow that did not like the forefront. Listen, I'm done. Andrew was the guy that brought the lad, little lad that have, had the five fishes or the five loaves and two fishes. Andrew was the one that went to the Greeks the non-Jewish people that heard him talking about Jesus said, you want to meet him? Follow me. He took them to Jesus. Andrew might not have said a lot. He might not have been charismatic. He might not have had a winsome attitude, but he knew to bring people to Jesus Christ. Young boy, come over here. The master has need of you. You fellas, you want to hear who Jesus Christ is? You follow me. Sirs, we would see Jesus. You want to see him? Come on over here. I'll lead you to him. And what I'm saying is, you can do that today. Get them under the gospel of the preaching of the message where Christians are praying the Spirit of God is moving, distractions are kept away, and they can have the full-on force of the conviction of the Spirit of God. Get them under the preaching of the sound of the preaching of God's Word. Now listen, you might not be a preacher. You can still be a reacher. I like the word preach. If you take P off, it's reach. If you take the R off, it's each. Preach, reach, each. That's what it's all about. There was an old Scottish preacher, I'll close with this illustration, old Scottish preacher. He'd been preaching in that, in that church for a year, and he had a man come up to him, a deacon come up to him, and he said, you've been here for a year, and there's only been one saved, and it's just a little boy. That little boy, when he was saved, came up, and he looked at the preacher with big, big brown eyes, blinked him, and he said, preacher, if I study hard, do you think God will call me to be a minister? That preacher looked down to that young boy and said, Yes, Robert, I think God will. That little boy grew up to be Robert Moffat, one of the greatest missionaries to the continent of Africa in history. Robert Moffat goes over to Africa, wins countless souls to Jesus Christ, planting churches. He comes back to England and he's preaching. And I want to read to you the quote that he said. 
He said, I've lifted up mine eyes and looked to the vast plains. I've seen on the horizon the smoke of villages, thousands of them, where the gospel has never been heard. Won't somebody go? At the close of the service, a young man that was sitting in the front came up and said, could God use me in Africa? His name was David Livingston, the greatest missionary to Africa in church history. What am I saying? I'm saying this. God works on both ends of the fishing pole. All he asks of us, just trust him. Follow through with what he said. You're going to be used of God to reach a soul that will be used to reach another soul that will be used of God to reach another soul. Friend, when you stand before Jesus Christ one day, you won't be there empty-handed. There'll be people around you that will come up, possibly say, thank you for sharing the gospel. Who's this behind you? Oh, that's somebody that I led to Christ. Who's that behind him? Oh, that's somebody that they led to Christ. And it goes on and on. Who is it that God wants to use? Anybody that will say, here, my Lord, send me. Are you willing to go? Let's pray. Our Father, thank you, Lord, for the person that you saved that told me about the glorious gospel. Thank you, Lord, for the person that you saved that told him about the glorious gospel. And on and on we go. It's a beautiful thing, Lord, to think about. God, there are souls that may be sitting here in our very presence that have never asked you to save them. They've never experienced conviction of sin by the Holy Spirit. Lord, if that be the case, whether they're here or listening away, may they now, may they call on you, Lord, to save them. Lord, I'm praying for our Christian brothers and sisters here. And I'm asking that you would, this challenge, Lord, will be put deep within the recesses of their heart. Stir us and trouble us because you surely have opportunities that are awaiting this week. God, help us to be sensitive. Help us to be fishers of souls. In your name we pray, dear Jesus. Amen. Would you stand, please, with your heads bowed and eyes closed? And I want to ask you a very searching question. How many of you here would lift your hand and say, there's somebody that is lost that I love very much in my life? Would you raise your hand? I have somebody that I love very much that I know is lost. There are hands all over the place. Right there where you're at, would you pray? Call that person's name, that family out, whoever it is, and say, God, give me an opportunity. And God, when you do, I'm going to trust you to give me the ability, the power or with all to tell the gospel. Our pianist and organist playing now, if you'd like to come pray, do so, please. Do so, please. If you're here and you're without Jesus Christ as your Savior, we want you to come more than anything in this world. Love to see you come. Our counselors are standing ready to receive you. As people come, would you come? God, empower me just to be a witness. Help me to trust you. God, forgive me for not being concerned about the lost. Help me, Lord. Many are coming. You're welcome to join them. If you're here and lost, you, you need to come, please. If you'd like to come and talk to one of our counselors about baptism or about church membership, now would be the time to come. Brother Mark, would you please come and give us a song of invitation? The cross upon which Jesus died Is a shelter in which we can hide And its grace so free is sufficient for me And deep is its fountain as wide as the sea there's room at the cross for you there's room at the cross for you though millions have come there's still There's room at the cross for you. Though millions have found him a friend and have turned from the sins which they sin, the Savior still waits 
to open the gates and welcome a sinner before it's too late. Let's sing it. There's room at the cross for you. Amen. There's room at the cross for you. Though millions have come, there's still room for one. Yes, there's room. you glad there was room when you came? Amen. There's room. There's room. Samuel, come on up here and stand with David, please. This is Samuel Norris. And Sam desires membership at Gospel Light by statement of faith. And I recommend him as a member of Gospel Light. Be praying for him. Can I get a motion, please? All right. Second. Jack, you're always fast on the trigger. Everybody in favor, would you signify the hearty amen? Amen. As I understand it, you're going to be baptized tonight, sis, right? Yes. Okay, so she's going to get baptized. Like God's doing a work in their life. We need to help them. I'm glad you are. If you have time, come on by, shake their hands, get to meet the Norris's, okay? We had a gospel light, 1,099. Well, let's just round it up. We'll count the Holy Ghost and count 1,100. God bless y'all. Be safe as you go home. Come back tonight. Well, we trust that the Lord spoke to your heart through our online services today. If you have trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior or made an important spiritual decision, connect with us at glbcs.org. We appreciate you taking the time to tune in today. I am Matthew Morrison, pastor of Gospel Light Baptist Church in Walkertown, North Carolina. Thank you for tuning in, and may God bless you as you go. I'm on.